Welcome to Vantage Point Podcast, a podcast brought to you by NWR Communications and 92 Studio. This podcast is intended for education and entertainment purposes only and does not constitute financial advice. G'day and welcome to the latest episode of Vantage Point and today we're joined by Stephen Crisp for the second time who's the CEO and Managing Director of Racing and Sports or RAS Technologies listed on the ASX under the ticker RTH. Racing and Sports are a leading provider of fully integrated premium data and enhanced content to the global racing and wagering industries. Their clients include Tabcorp, Entang Group, which is Ladbrokes, and many more, including some recent additions which we discuss on the episode. The last year was a year of significant milestones with the execution of landmark deals with Stake.com, Playbook Engineering, and also the delivery of strong financial results, including record revenue and strong ARR growth. Since then, they've also entered a strategic partnership with a gaming and wagering industry investor, Waterhouse VC, uh, led by Tom Waterhouse. We hope you enjoy the episode. Okay, Stephen, welcome back to Melbourne. It's been probably 18 months, I think, since the, the last time we did this, or ra- rather 12 months. Fair bit's happened since. Um, I think on the last one, I sort of highlighted at the end of the podcast, yeah, the EV of the business was roughly 10 million bucks, or a market cap of 20 uh, was sitting at at now 70. Um, love to call us the oracle, but it was a bit of a, a diamond in the rough, and thankfully the market's seen it. But just to give us a bit of a recap on the story before you know, we talk about the updates since that podcast, yeah. um, give us the racing and sports or RTH story in 100 words or less. Yeah, I think the last 12 months has been a really pivotal time in the company's growth, So Simon. Yep. Um, we were massively undervalued, I think, at that time. And, um, you know, obviously the hard work we were doing hadn't translated into the share price um, or the market cap. We're seeing that that's now flowing through really nicely. Um, obviously, some of the deals we've done, the instrumental deals we've done uh, in the UK, uh, globally with the likes of Stake, uh, and domestically here in Australia with our existing customer base, have really set us up for, um, you know, the great results we've seen, but also future growth um, into new and expanding and emerging markets. So the last 12 months has been really good, um, but I think there's a lot more to come. I'm certainly very excited for what the future holds, uh, you know, with the business and, uh, and how we're tracking to date. So RTH, 100 words or less, give it a go. Racing and Sports is a global leader in data, technology and digital services for the global wagering, gaming and casino industries. That's uh, it's probably about 56. That's pretty good. Go. Um, so the last time you were here, um, there was four divisions to the business. Now there's three. Just talk us through that. Look, we consolidated our uh, integrity and consulting practice back into the business. Now, I think we'll probably see a likely fourth pillar come out of the business around industry technology hmm. uh, in the future. We are doing a lot more with industry now, so uh, rights holders, regulatory bodies, um, you know, PRAs around uh, around the country, but also uh, internationally as well, the likes of the GBGB. So, you know, we've got our data business, which is obviously is core to what we do. Uh, a lot of innovation happening in that part of the business as well. The wagering tech part of the business is growing rapidly with our SaaS and MTS offerings. And M- both of MTS those being? Managed trading services. Yep. So that's best in class. And, um, you know, the, we're seeing a lot more demand with uh, operators looking to try and take cost out um, as well as increase their yields uh, from their, their bookmaking operations on racing. And this is certainly what they're geared at doing. So. And so maybe if we just step back in terms of you know, a couple of lines of the business as case study, where do you sort of fit in the industry and who, who uses you? Yeah, so look, we're a, I mean, a B2B provider predominantly. We do have a B2C platform in the digital space, but a B2B provider to all the tier ones here in the Australian market. So we do all their content, their data, their comments, their predictions, their tips. Uh, all that data is driven through racing and sports. Uh, you know, really critical stuff. Um, without that, there's no prompts. There's no information to the bookmakers' uh, customers in in uh, order to get them to participate and have a bet. So really important stuff to actually um, engage with customers. You know, so that part of the business is really evolving quite rapidly. Um, and, you know, the bookmakers that we service here in Australia, but also around the world, are looking for that innovation as well. And um, when you talk about the, the data and the form and the comments and whatnot, is that is that an automated product? Is it yeah, built over a number of years in terms of, you know, I know your dad... Yeah. Uh, one of the founders of Racing and Sports and one of the leading form analysts you know, globally. How does that sort of spit out? Yeah, look, a really sophisticated um, you know, uh, IP and processing systems within the business to actually generate uh, all of that work automatically. We do have a team of form analysts who do do QA um, yep. on the products before they go out. But by and large, when you're dealing with 35 countries of racing mm. every day, three codes, um, you know, you couldn't do it manually. So That's it's a pretty, um, pretty big scale. It is largely automated. So, yeah, very important to have that. And so when, when you talk about um, the different 
yeah, sort of milestones throughout, you know, particularly FY24. Um, a lot of those were in in the sort of pipe and in the works, you know, years prior. It takes a long time to spit these sort of things out. What do you sort of see as the sort of watershed moments um, or the big deals that have yeah. landed over the last 12 months? Great question. Uh, look, probably the UK deals with uh, Playbook Engineering and, and more recently Pragmatic Play. Their platforms, um, they're obviously based in the UK uh, with UK bookmakers. Um, typically, those deals would have been won by the incumbents over there. Uh, we've come into that market. We've disrupted. We've achieved a license over there to actually resell. That was the, that was the rights. The UK rights, rights, yeah. That's right, to resell the UK racing data. Which was quite hard to tap into, right? It, was, it is, yeah. It was almost like a monopoly, yeah. Yeah, it took us probably 12 months to get those licenses in place. Yep. Uh, distribu- uh, distribution agreements, rather. And now that we've got those, that essentially was a ticket to play in that UK theatre where we've now been able to actually work with operators in the UK, servicing them with domestic information as well as all of our global content as well. And if we step back and have a look at the sort of competitive landscape, who you're sort of up against, um, who you sort of replaced in the past and whatnot, yeah. what does that look like? Look, typically um, within the domestic market, it's probably bet makers. Yep. Um, we don't compete everywhere with them and they don't compete everywhere with us, but we do have some crossover uh, around data and content, probably trading. Um, I like to think we work in sort of different parts of the market. They deal with their own platform um, and, and their own operators. We deal with all the tier ones, um, yep. you know, and so we sort of play in slightly different spaces, which is um, which has been okay. Uh, and then internationally, they're probably the Press Association, who are very, mm. uh, I'd say, look, they're very heavy, bloated. Uh, they've got a very slow workforce. They're pretty old school. Very old school, yeah. yeah. Not a lot of automation or innovation coming out of there, but they do have a dominant position in that UK market, so... And if we have a look at Playbook Engineering in, in particular, I know that the company, you know, is, I think revenue grows sort of 40% uh, FY24 over FY23. A large part of that sort of revenue growth didn't include necessarily Playbook Engineering and, and right. Stake. Um, what is Playbook? Uh, how does that look and what, what is it actually all about? What are you providing there? Yeah, so Playbook, we're actually their racing provider of their racing products. So they're an established sports So it's a wagering... Company. It is, yeah, product, yeah. Yeah, the, so they're a white label um, uh, service provider, so they yep. will provide many bookmakers with a, a platform, uh, all their sports data, but uh, importantly, we're providing their racing data. Sure. We're providing our trading platform, our pricing platform to them as well. And that essentially scales as a fixed fee per uh, operator that comes online. Pragmatic Play is different. Yep. So they uh, have come online with DAZONBET, and they are using our trading software as well as all their data and content. And they are actually, there is upside in that deal as well. So the more brands they bring online, but they're looking at the more of a tier one type offering. So DAZNBET, obviously, DAZN are a massive media yep. brand globally. Uh, Pragmatic Play um, are a massive brand in themselves. They provide a lot of casino games to the industry, a lot of sports um, and other innovation. And now they've moved into racing with their, their platform. So we'll see more coming out of them. But none of those have really been represented in the in the financial figures we've seen to date, only mm. a very small amount. So, um, so pleasingly, that should all flow through this year. And stake dot com, uh, it's a pretty big, pretty big deal, and mm. and a one that could really move the needle over time. Just talk us how that came about, and obviously they don't have a license here uh, in terms of gaming. That's know, right. From a horse racing perspective in Australia, but. Uh, they're pretty big globally. Yeah, they're massive. And look, they, they don't take bets here in Australia. They um, And it's really not their focus area at the moment. They're an international operator. They take bets where it's legal to do that and they geo-block and geo-fence where it's not. Uh, they're quite responsible in how they do that because they do want to be a highly regulated uh, participant in, in the industry, particularly racing. They've made it very clear they're more than happy to pay rights fees back to rights holders getting under the appropriate licences and, um, and we've seen that um, happening. So... Uh, they're probably through 60, 70% of those rights agreements now. So it's a process to... It's a process. To really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but they're going really well and they're um, they're a really great operation. They're, they're very agile, very innovative. They're disrupting the market. Uh, and, you know, we were fortunate to be uh, included in the tender process they went out for. To so how long was that line. process? How, how did that sort of look? It's relatively rapid from first engagement through to contract signing. It's probably maybe three to four months. It's so, pretty, uh, yeah. That's very agile in terms of a, a fast growth startup for sure. It is. I mean, they've been around for quite some time, but obviously yep. bringing the racing product on board uh, was quite a, you know, a complex... So you're powering all, all of that? All the racing, correct, yeah. yes. All the data and content, innovation on the front end, um, you know, the, the race verdicts, the uh, runner comments, the tips, um, all the stats and analytics, as well as the trading services on the back end as well for managing the bets coming through. Yeah. And from a, an industry perspective, obviously, you know, Tab Corp, uh, had, had a bit of a reset and there's yeah, been a whole bunch of pressure on a number of the sort of bookmakers and wagering operators. How do you sort of look at 
you know, obviously, you know, cost of inflation and, yeah, there has to be some sort of bite in terms of, you know, turnover and those sort of things. But how does the, the industry go about, you know, sustaining growth or, you know, as you talk to, you know, the new, the new punter, the new generation, um, you know, getting involved? Yeah, look, wagering's got a lot of headwinds. Um, Tabcor, probably some of the most um, headwinds, only given the regulatory mm. environment which they have to operate, where a lot of the other corporates don't. So, Tabcor, it's it's so important that Tabcor do you know survive and exist in the industry. They they provide a lot of good social benefit, community benefit, um, obviously benefit back to the racing industry itself. Uh, you know, I think with Gill now at the yep. helm, um, you know, we'll see a, a renewed. Um, you know, business in the Tabcor entity, and, and hopefully, um, you know, we can play a supporting role to assist them in their growth and um, and their reinvention, uh, as it were. So, I'm optimistic that they'll, you know, um, they'll really take to the challenge and uh, and rise, you know, to, to be the great brand they once were and, and still can be. And in terms of consolidation in the sector, I've already seen that with you know, uh, Betar and and Bluebet and those sort of different things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's sort of talk around points bet and and whatnot. How do you sort of see you know, the rest of the industry playing out? Look, we're seeing consolidation mainly at the lower level. So the mm. smaller brands are either, um, some of them have actually closed shop altogether. Yep. Um, some of them are consolidating. So there, it is happening, probably not at the tier one level where we are mainly exposed. We don't really have any exposure at that that smaller level. We don't deal in the in the small brands at the moment. The tier two is an interesting market. I mean, that's where we probably will see consolidation um, as well with the likes of um, BetR and Bluebet coming together. We obviously service Bluebet. Uh, they've taken our product um, into the BetR platform as well. Yep. And there's also... Because BetR, we're using BetMakers. BetMakers, correct. Yep. yep. So yep. they've transferred that all over to us, which is pleasing. Yep. Um, and look, PointsBet, I mean, they're a great brand. Um, I really like what they do. And, uh, you know, obviously we've just signed them as a customer as well. I, I've heard rumours, um, mm. you know, no, like no. everyone, I, you know, you don't know until it happens, if it happens. So, um, but, uh, you, you know, certainly not a lot of consolidation, but there are headwinds coming yep. and have been coming for quite some time. And I think we might have even touched on this last time. Yeah, no, it definitely yeah. Uh, provides opportunity. Yeah. Um, and just again, on the sort of regulatory landscape, there's been a lot made um, of late in terms of gambling advertising, um, you know, in sports, in telecast, you know, et cetera, et cetera. How does that, you know, what's your view on that and how does that affect... Yeah, racing and sports. Yeah, look, I think the industry probably went too far, and I think certain brands probably went too far, um, too aggressive with their advertising, particularly when you know you've got um, you know kids and yeah. uh, and the like. You're watching you know watching the football on a Friday night, and you know might ask mum and dad what what a same game multi is. It's yeah. not really appropriate. So I think that all needs to be wound back. Yeah, but. The relationship between sports gambling and racing gambling is probably very different. You know, where racing is an industry that's sort of been built on wagering and, and it's a skill-based, you know, pastime, I guess. Yeah. So, you know, I think there should be advertising restrictions, but I think it's got to be very well considered around how it actually impacts the broader industry uh, and particularly racing as well. There are lots of jobs at stake, but if they get it wrong, we'll have a massive impact. And from a, a racing and sports um, RTH perspective, um, obviously you have... I don't know what it is. Yeah, probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions, yeah, visits um, to the page every year. Yeah. Um, those those implications around yeah bans of of advertising that's not going to impact. Look, RTA if anything, to, probably it's an opportunity. Yeah, it pushes advertisers to us. I mean, yeah. our, our platform is over three million unique viewers every year, sixty million yeah. page views. Uh, it's growing. We're adding a lot more innovation to it. We've just launched a racing and sports app. Yeah. So you know, uh, it's in the Play Store and uh, Apple Store. So get it while it's hot. Uh, and you know those sort of things give us the ability to advertise our customers and also yep. other other you know participants in the and market. And it's specific to the market, so it's not specific it's not going to be you know, implicated around. You're only those. going there if you want to look at racing information, yep. stats, and um, interactive uh, features on the site. So it's all free, and um, you know it's worth uh, people checking it out if they haven't seen it because it is a great uh, source of you know, source of racing information, news, and editorial. We have journalists uh, who are well respected in the Australian and global industries working for us. No, that's perfect, and. Uh, Waterhouse VC, Tom Waterhouse, uh, recently signed a deal with Racing and Sports you know, to strategically invest in a, an options package linked to a number of different milestones. Can you just talk us through how that came about and the relationship there? Yeah, look, we've known the Waterhouse family for you know, probably 20 years, um, you know, with uh, with my father, the founder of the business, and obviously he races horses with Gay, so do I. Um, you know, they're a great family within the racing industry. They're a great brand. Uh, and the deal with Tom probably started 12 months ago. We had a conversation over in London. Um, you know, we, we kept the dialogue open. We weren't quite ready for it then. We certainly are now, and this is why we brought it forward to help grow our business to the next level. You know, um, he has a great network and a great brand. Uh, he does a lot of public speaking. 
um, you know, people really do follow Tom. Um, he's, he's managed to get a lot of uh, decisions right in the industry mm. and, and pick a lot of trends and emerging trends. Uh, so really, you know, it's quite exciting for us to be partnered with him and help him to execute on deals as well as bring deals to us to, uh, you know, to work with. And when you talk about deals, what, what at a very high level, what, is, what does that sort of look like? Look, pretty much everything. I mean, uh, opportunities within the racing and wagering space. Um, so it could be everything from acquisitions all the way through to uh, data and content deals uh, that we might be able to do with customers, people within his VC fund, um, or people that he he meets and, uh, and and talks to along his um, you know the way that he goes with he travels the world uh, Latin America USA UK quite heavily and, and also here in Australia so he comes across a lot of opportunity because the way that I sort of looked at the deal is you know it's almost a, a low cost or low risk uh, option in terms of instead of staffing up uh, and trying to hire you know, senior execs to go and you know, tap those markets and find those different deals if they don't come then yeah you know, he doesn't get there. The options and the upside, right? So it's yeah, you know, it's all uh, yeah. literally all upside in, in terms of particularly if, if you do good deals, uh, it's going right. to pay off. Yeah, look, it's good for shareholders. It's good for the business, um, and I think you know we're all incentivised to work together uh, to get you know get the right deals done. We don't have to do any of the deals that he brings to us. Yeah, uh, we need to have complete control over that, um, and you know Tom's respected that uh, the whole way along, and um, you know certainly the deals that we have seen to date have been very good, and we are pursuing several of them at the moment. So. You know, it's been a good start. And from a seasonality perspective, obviously, I imagine, yeah, from a busyness side, um, spring racing, yeah, peaks. Mm. Uh, is that the right way to look at it from a seasonal perspective as well, or is it global enough now that it sort of, yeah, yeah, you know, sort of peters out, sort of thing? It is, yeah. I mean, we have, um, you know, when Australian racing sort of is peaking, the UK yep. racing is um, is sort of coming on. It's it's quite quiet over there, yep. so that's where they get a lot of work done in that part of the world. So. I think it's relatively flat, um, the seasonality now. Yeah, and so what um, sort of key objectives or key activities? You know, uh, I know with the Melbourne Melbourne Cup, you did the you know, digital race and whatnot, um, yeah, which VRC yep. uh, powered as well. Uh, what should we look for there coming mm-hmm. up in spring More racing? More of this year, yeah, yep. absolutely. Yep. So we're working with the VRC for those um, animations for every race that's run, those, those predictions, uh, as well as some other media coverage as well, and working with some of their uh, their vision um, as well and, and, and providing some of our data and content to actually really enhance that viewer experience. Yep. And from a, a personal perspective, obviously, uh, coming on as managing director, which didn't really change you know, from a day-to-day perspective, but uh, how have you seen the last, yeah, the journey from listing, yeah, as a pretty shitty market to be to be frank um yeah sort of you know batting batting down the desk um not seeing any results in terms of the share price obviously you know now it's pleasing but we're still sort of you know just getting back to to square one in terms of the ipo price how do you sort of look at that journey it's been a frustrating journey uh, in some ways but also a really rewarding mm-hmm. journey in others um you know, when we started, we were deer, deers in the headlights. You yeah. know, you really don't know what to expect. Uh, we, you know, have a good team around us. Um, we certainly uh, brought on many more good people into the team. Um, you know, and it's just been execute, execute, execute. Just, you know, we've been telling the market we're going to do something. Mm. We need to execute, do it, show the results. And that's been really important. And I think, you know, the market's now finally cotton on to the fact that these guys have been talking, uh, you know, to us regularly. They've been mm. telling us we're going to do something. They've done it. And they can see the increase in revenue and profit every year. We've just turned out, you know, first profit two and a half years after listing. You know, a great achievement for the business. Uh, and there's more to come. So, you know, I mean, my journey has been one of just patience. You yeah. Know, you can't change the market. You can't change shareholder sentiment apart from, you know, showing results. Deliver. And that will get the confidence of the market, which I think we're doing now, which has been really pleasing. Yeah, I think uh, you've done you've done that very well. And if we sort of look fast forward, you know, to... to two to four years away how does racing and sports look um obviously touch wood you know stakes scaled up yeah that's gonna that's been a process in terms of the rights and you know hopefully the fruits of the label come through there you know you've got pragmatic you've got playbook um you've got the uk you know there's global expansion how does it sort of look yeah look more of the same um i definitely think we'll see more of these crypto style operators coming online who who want to be regulated they want to work with industry um you know crypto itself is becoming a much more recognized uh, mm. regulated industry on its own so i think we'll see more of that activity um we'll, we'll definitely see more growth in the uk market and um, possibly into the us as well we've got some ambition there to um to you know, incrementally grow the business into the us more. And how, how would you tap the us would that be you know through partner or both yeah partnerships and direct pa- partnership first sort of and yeah. then scale through through that exactly it's a massive market um, a lot of people have gone over there and lost a lot of money we're yep. not planning on doing that we're, we're, we're going to be quite surgical I think we've used that word before and yep. about how we 
we execute in the US, but we have good partners and good um, good relationships with the right people in that part of the world to do this right. So, you know, probably not this financial year, but but potentially next financial year, I think we'll start to see some activity in the US. Yeah, you've uh, you've executed very well today. Uh, it's good to hear more of the same because that's not. Uh, outlandish or going outside the boundaries. Stephen, well done on the last 12 months and good luck yeah, for the future. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks.